<laughs> well, Carl, did you find it? I don't have all day, you know. A little less attitude, please, chef. Or as I say today, a little less tune, dude. I found it, but I had to work my way through a truckload of pots and pans to find it. Well, that's not a grater. You said grinder. Grater! Grinder! I said grater! Grinder! Grater! Grinder! Grater! Is this what you're looking for? Who put it down there? It's always been down there! Yum, yum, yum. Yum, yum, yum. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, yum. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of One Chef, One Critic. I'm Carl Wells, food critic for The Telegram. And I'm Chef Steve Watson of Central Dairies. Well, see, perhaps you could explain why you were so anxious to have a grater. Well, no problem, Carl. What I've got here, yeah, I've got some semi-frozen butter. And what I like to do, I like to grate it. And this is absolutely fantastic for when you're making muffins, or even if you want to add a little bit of flour for it, for a bermagne, for thickening sauces. And it blends really nicely together, you see. So you can just go like this, I nice did. curve. I didn't know you could grate butter. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I guess I knew it was possible, but <laughs> I, I've never actually seen anybody do it before. And you could do this with unsalted butter as well. Mm -hmm. So as I say, it's great for baking. You just take small portions. It's great for creaming your, your blend, you see. So, so, so uh, you, you have to, you don't have to wait as long for it to kind of just become a part of whatever the, uh, the mixture is. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. There's another interesting thing I learned about butter uh, recently. Uh, the color of butter mm -hmm. depends on what the animal was eating. Correct, correct. So I guess if it's butter that comes from cow's milk or butter that comes from sheep's milk, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. the color of the butter depends on what that animal was eating. Again, it, it could be seasonal as well, whether they've been out in the meadows or in the Of course, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, coming up on the program today, we have as our guest, Dr. Sandy Morris. Sandy is, a, of course, a, a legend in Newfoundland and Labrador, a very famous composer and musician. And what will we be preparing for Sandy today? We're going to be making a beautiful vegetarian dish. It's going to be sauteed Mediterranean vegetables in phyllo pastry with goat cheese. That sounds mm. quite good, actually. Yeah. Um, I'll look forward to seeing what color the goat cheese is. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we also have on the program today Chef Bob Arneal of chef to go and he's going to be doing a bit of an appetizer for us, a magnificent seafood chowder, so stay tuned. For a complete listing of One Chef, One Critic recipes, wine lists and more, check out our website. Let us know what you think of the show at 757-9600. Well, it gives us great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sandy Morris to One Chef, One Critic now. And uh, it's kind of weird calling you doctor. I'll so never get used to it. Really. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to refer to you as Sandy. And, and I'll no, I'm not the kind of doctor who can do anything for you. That's right. <laughs> well, you can, but uh, not in a medical <laughs> maybe, way. Maybe if you need your strings changed, I could. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Stephen, what are we going to be making? today. Well, we're going to be making Sandy. It's a beautiful vegetarian dish. We're going to do some Mediterranean vegetables. I've got some eggplant, zucchinis and peppers and uh, artichokes. We're going to saute them off. We're going to put them in some phyllo pastry with some uh, uh, ghost cheese and Carl's going to grow some vegetables. So oh, okay. we'll get started. I'll just pop a little bit of oil into the pan. Looks uh, good and sounds good. It looks a lot like my country. There you go. <laughs> and uh, we'll pop some onions in there and garlic. I'll get you to start stirring. Yep. Okay, we've got a wooden spoon there, and Carl, feel free to go with hey. asparagus. Though. All right. I like to cook myself. You do you really? I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I do yeah. Most of the Anything now. a speciality of yours, or? Uh, you know, I actually like to improvise a lot. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm like a jazz cook. Very good. So we're putting these in phyllo pastry. How how, how many uh, asparagus uh, spears actually, do you need? Actually, Carl, that's going to go underneath. It's going to be a garnish. Oh, this oh. is going to drizzle that with balsamic vinegar and some okay, olive oil. Okay, right okay. On, and then yeah. the phyllo pastry okay. is going to go on top. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. Sandy, I have to ask you. Yep. You started playing the guitar when you were 15 years of age. That's right. Do, what what motivated you to, to to start playing the guitar? Well, uh, it, it, my cousin Jim Hennessy was played in a band called the Ravens, who were the, arguably the most popular band at the time. Right. And, you know, he had the, one of the first Fender Stratocaster guitars, electric guitars, on the island. That very famous guitar. Yeah, and yeah. He, he would, you know, he would encourage me to, to go, even though I didn't know how to play at the time, he would encourage me to experiment with it and pick it up and use it. It was just fascinating. So he was a big inspiration. But then when I saw Elvis on, on the Ed Sullivan show, <laughs> that sold us. 
all together, right? Yeah. So it was a whole bunch, and there was always a lot of music around my family, but the guitar just fascinated me. Do you play any other instruments? Yeah, I play, uh, uh, well, anything with strings on it except violin. Okay. And I play, you know, keyboards, accordion, percussions, whatever. Whatever it takes. You branch out. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> whatever it takes. Well, well, doing Land and Sea, for example, yeah. you know, we, we don't have the budget to be able to hire a whole lot of musicians, so if, if I need an accordion part, I figure out how to play it myself. Yeah. Well, I'll get to Land and Sea in a minute, but uh, you mentioned the uh, Stratocaster. Yes. Uh, you, in 1968, yep. you bought a 1967 Martin That's right. P18 acoustic yeah. guitar, yeah. and there's a lovely story associated yes. with how you got that guitar. Well, the, the, how I got it, for one thing, I, I, it was really interesting. I couldn't afford it, of course. Was, in 68, I was 20 years old, going, yeah, yeah. going, going to university, but playing a lot, and that was down at Hutton's Music Store, and it was in behind the counter. You had to ask permission to play it. But oh, every really? Every time I went in, Mr. Hutton would say, Sandy, you've got to try that Martin. And I kept saying, boy, Baz, I can't, I can't afford it, so I'm not going to play it because I know I'll fall in love with it. I went in one day, and a buddy of mine was playing it, and he handed it over to me. He said, here, Sandy, you've got to try this. And I, and I played it, and I thought, oh, what am oh. I going to do? So, so Baz said, you know, you've got to have it. He said, it's got to be your guitar. I said, Baz, I don't have the money. It was $800, right? Eh? He said, come over across the street. And so he went over and signed the bank loan. Oh, really? really? Yeah. <laughs> Is that great? And I was able to pay him off $20 a month for however many years it took me to pay it uh, off. But the interesting thing is, a couple of years ago, it really needed to be repaired. You know, like after playing so it. So you still have it? Oh, yes. It's my main guitar. Yeah. After 45 years, it needed some tender love and care, right? Yes. Yeah. It just happens to these things. So I sent it off to Toronto to the Martin repair shop that's in Canada. They don't do it at the factory anymore. And the guy up there called me and he said, Is it still under warranty? And I laughed my head off. <laughs> I don't think there was ever a piece of paper between me and Mr. Hutton, no. <laughs> and he said, you've got to phone Martin, he said, because they're really good about their warranty. So I phoned the guy at Martin, and he said, have you got any way at all to prove that you are the original owner of the guitar? So I said, the son of the guy I bought it off is still around. That's right. I can, I can have him. Do, yeah. do you want him to sign an affidavit? He said, no, just have him send us an email. So John Hutton yes, of course. sent uh, an email to the Martin people, <laughs> and I sent them a picture, emailed them a picture of me with yeah. the guitar when it was new, and yeah. they honored the warranty. 700 bucks <laughs> towards the repair shop, right? Oh, really? really? So I paid, I paid $800 for that guitar in 1968. Yeah. 45 years later, they gave me back $700. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, it's a great story. That's a great story. But what a great company to, to you know, actually put that it's, much into it there. It certainly says a lot about the company, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they were very pleasant to deal with. There was no problems at all. And they paid directly to the uh, repair company in Toronto. My right. goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, Sandy, we've got all our Mediterranean vegetables in there. Yeah. We've got some artichokes. We've got some calamatra olives mm -hmm. there. And we've also got our peppers, onions. And yeah. I'm just, kind of just uh, binding a little bit of tomato sauce on there as well. And that's got a little bit of spinach into it. And I've got some mixed herbs, which I've creamed in there. I've oh, got some well. basil and I've got yeah. some thyme. Yeah. Uh, very, very colorful. Isn't Absolutely. It? Yeah. Very colorful. And then we'll just pop that in there and away that's you go. One of the things I like about cooking is combining colors. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and of course, vegetables, I mean, they're all about color. They they're are. all about <laughs> color, indeed they are. I uh, just want to get to uh, Land and Sea now, since you yep. mentioned it. Uh, how, we all know that you did the theme for Land and Sea, which is a very famous theme. Yes. Um, how, did, how did that come about? How did that gig start? Because well, eventually you, you started scoring music for every single episode. Yes. Which you still do. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Over 20 yeah. years now, 20 seasons. Yeah. Uh, a, 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 my first gig with Land and Sea was back in the 70s with Ralph Walker. Oh, my goodness, yeah. yeah. And uh, when we got to the end of the session, the producer asked us, is there anything else you can play? Because Ralph, he, he came into the session with all these books, Irish music, Scottish music, English you know, folk yeah, songs, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And we read all that, and the producer said at the end, he said, got anything else? So we started making stuff up. And that's where the closing theme from Land and Sea came. Wow. Hmm. From that session. So that was yeah. uh, in the 70s. And when Pauline Thornhill took over as producer, uh, what, what producers up to that point had been doing for music, like the session that Ralph and I went in, we just played whatever we could. They had all kinds of musicians, Kelly Russell, um, you know, Jim Payne, various people would go in and just play. And so when, the, when they were packaging the show, you just reach into a bag of tape and pull out a tape and put it on and see what that was and see if it would work with your scene. Oh, so yeah. Pauline thought it would be interesting to have something, you know, yeah. new and something that was written to picture. Exactly, yeah. So that, that started off, and then after th it was after that that I did the opening theme again, because Gordon Quinton did that originally. Oh, that's right, yeah, yeah I forgot about that. So, so tell me about the process of scoring a, yep. a film or a documentary or TV show like that. Yeah, well, with Land and Sea, they give me a copy of the show with visual points where they want me to start and end the music. Mm -hmm. 
that doesn't necessarily happen in every uh, you know, mm. movie that happens, but that's the way it works with Lancy. And then I, I get the pictures and I sit down with a guitar in my hand and I just look and, and play and, until I come up with something that I'm happy with and hopefully they'll be happy with. Yeah, and it's all based on what you see on the screen. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you might get a, you know, if some guy's chopping wood, that might be the, the tempo, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Or, or if there's a, a machine putting yeah. in the background, right? That's Whatever, right. you know. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sandy, what I've done here, I've uh, got our phyllo pastry. Normally you would put clarified butter. I put olive oil on there. Right. We put our vegetables underneath, our Mediterranean vegetables, some goat cheese, and yeah. then we'll just make a pocket out of it like this. Wow. Just bring it around like so. And then we're going to bake that in the oven just like that. Lovely. Okay? Yeah. Perfect. That looks like it's going to be Divine. absolutely yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Well, Sandy, yep. I'm going to talk out because I'm going to go to the wine cellar uh -huh. and see if we can come up with a nice wine yep. to go with this vegetables in phyllo dish. Yep. You carry on with Stephen there. Will do, yeah. I'll be back. Perfect. Now, how, how, what temperature do you bake that at? I'm going to bake it at 400, Sandy. For okay. about, uh, it's only going to be golden brown, so because everything great. else is cooked, yes. it's probably going to take maybe about 10 minutes maximum. Oh, okay. you know, and then we're going to put our nice asparagus underneath it, some drizzle with some balsamic vinegar, yep. lovely boy. There we go. Wow. Hi, Jennifer. Hey, Carl. Jennifer Murray of P&S Wines, and it's so nice to have you back Thank on you. One Chef, One Critic. We have, uh, it's a vegetarian dish essentially. We've got sautéed vegetables, and we've wrapped them up in a phyllo pastry, and we've, we've put in some goat cheese just to make it a little bit more interesting. So what kind of wine would you have with something like that? It sounds delicious, Carl. Um, well, you can go with white or red, both will complement really well, but they have to be lighter. So I have uh, some good suggestions. Mm -hmm. The first one is a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. It's a beautiful Sauvignon Blanc with green fruit and with a very nice acidity. And the uh, acidity will go especially good with the goat cheese. Georges Michel Sauvignon yes. Blanc. Okay. Yes. And? And we have this wine at the NLC for $24.99. Okay. Yep. My second suggestion is a beautiful wine, um, Cabernet Franc from Benito region. Uh, Cabernet Franc has similar profile than Cabernet Sauvignon. The difference is that it's more fruity and less tannic. So it will really go well with the vegetables. Sounds like it, yeah. Delicious. Yeah. That sounds like a very good option as yes. well. Yep. And something different, I have a Cava from Spain. Mm. Uh, this is a very beautiful Cava, full bodied with a brioche nose and uh, with a little spiciness. So that will also complement your vegetables really well. Yeah, and you know, I find sparkling, whether it's Cava, Prosecco, Champagne, it goes All well with delicious. everything. All delicious, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, Carl. But I have, uh, I have to pick uh, our old friend Georges Michel because you've yes. been representing him for a yes. long time. And I actually had the privilege of meeting him and uh, I've tasted his reds many times, but uh, the Sauvignon Blanc, not it's so much. It's delicious, you will love it. It's an award winner wine and he we, loved Newfoundland when he yeah, was here. Yeah, he yes. did so, yes. yeah. So I'm going to check this one out, this 2013 Georges Michel uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Excellent. Thank you so Enjoy much. Enjoy it, Carl. Well, I think it's about time now that we took our phyllo pockets out of the oven. They were cooked for 10 minutes at 450 degrees. Beautiful. So we'll just put them on our plates, which we've already dressed. We've got some asparagus tips with olive oil and balsamic vinegar underneath there. That's one, two, and then a little bit more of our reduction of balsamic vinegar just to decorate the place like so. And let's go and see if Sandy and Carl are ready in the dining room. How's that? Quite the decanter. Mm. There we are. Yeah. Yes, nothing but the best. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, you, the prediction was true. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Stunning, in fact. But we do have to cut into it. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and taste so let's, let's try some. Yeah, 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 Sauteed yeah, yeah. vegetables in phyllo pastry. Yeah. See what it tastes like. I'll be critic. I'll be critic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you usually are, Carl. <laughs> you usually are. That's vegetarian heaven right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -mm. That's very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm picking up the. The balsamic vinegar, vinegar. I guess that's yep. from yep. the bottom. But the, the yeah. bottom, correct. That, add, yeah. that adds to it, actually. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. yeah. Well, uh, before we get totally stuck in here, yeah. uh, I wanted to talk to you about um, 
well, WGB essentially, but did did that start with 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 MUDS, the uh, Memorial University Drama Society? W were you a member of that? Or I, I was I was hung around that that you know we, we used to hang out in the in the room down underneath the stage. There was a little dressing That's room right. kind of down there. Yeah. We used to hang out down there, and I was associated with Codco, of course, in their drama. You know, yeah. when they were just a stage company. Yeah, yeah. And th so the idea of having Mary and Greg kind of came out of that because mm -hmm. they'd already done the Codco mm -hmm. situation. But essentially, what happened was. Kevin O'Connell, who was producer in there, but we'd done a whole bunch of different shows with Beth Harrington and various people, and he called me into the office one day and he said, look, we keep trying to do something that's as popular as all around the circle, and we can't get there, so if you got any ideas for a show? And I talked to Greg Malone and, and, uh, and White, his wife, and they said, well, what would you do? And I said, I'd like to put a band together that featured Ron Hines' songs and Newfoundland fiddle tunes that were kind of rocked up. And I think it was White had the idea of putting Mary and Greg in there and having a, uh, they'd be proprietors of this pub. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. That, yeah, that was yeah. called the Root Cellar. And so that, those six shows happened. Then they were canceled. Then the band went out and started playing live and got so popular that we were invited back again. <laughs> okay, that's how it happened. Because <laughs> yeah. I, remember, I remember the Root Cellar, having yep. worked at CBC all those years. Yep. I remember the Root Cellar, and I, I do remember how much like WGB the Root Cellar was. Well, it was the same band, and yeah. instead of Tommy and Greg, it was Miri and Greg. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it had this concept that it was in, in a, a little pub that the, that the yep. Budgels owned. But it, it just, I don't know what happened, it was just a culture clash and it never really gelled. But yeah. then the band started going out playing live and Tommy and Greg got involved in that and the thing just went to the Took roof. Off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. we were so popular that I think Jack Kellum came along and said, you know, we could do a show of this and, and instead of the Root Cellar we had the Grand Hall and all this stuff. And yeah, well I remember Jack uh, actually, he, he had gone out to I'm really dating myself now, <laughs> but he had gone out to the Strand Lounge at the Avalon yeah. Hall where you guys were performing. Yes, we were. And he yeah. had seen the yep. live show, yep. and I remember him coming back to the station and saying, "This is this is going to make a great TV show." Yeah, yeah. So that's how it all started. That, that's which, how it all started. We ended yeah. up doing forty-four episodes up in three seasons. Yeah. The last one was Network, so it, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a great run. Yeah, and but, and it was a live audience as well, right? Live audience, and uh, it was watched by. I think we had the highest ratings of any TV show up to that. Per, I can't remember what it was eighty-five or ninety percent of the of the eyeballs were watching. Really, oh, she, it had, seven or seven o'clock Monday night. Has, yeah, it had up. as many. I remember this because mm -hmm. I was on Here and Now. Yep. It had as many viewers as Here and Now, that's right, which yeah. was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No other show had ever come close no, to Here and Now. That's right. Yeah. But WGB had exactly the same audience, yeah. which was was amazing, really amazing yeah, accomplishment. Yeah, and it was yeah. great the way it worked because our live performances, <laughs> you know, kind of engendered an audience as well as the TV yeah. show it got people to come out to see us live. That's so right. Really all gelled really well. Yeah. yeah, I have to ask you before before we go because I did refer to you as Doctor yeah. earlier. Uh, what was it like receiving an honorary degree from Mun? It was really kind of mind blowing. I mean, I was delighted and honored, especially for other guitar players. <laughs> if you know what I mean? Like, how many guitar players end up being honorary right. doctors? And of course, I'd gone to Mun and left because I was so busy working as a mm. as a player. Uh, and I always wanted to finish my degree. And yeah. I, when I left, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll do this music for a few years, and then when it runs out, I'll just go back and finish my degree. And of course, it never happened. No, I, no. I have to stop working. Uh, so it was gr just delightful to get it. Although I have to say, it was the most nervous I ever was doing my acceptance speech on this it's yeah. on the stage of the Arts and Culture Center, which is like my second home. <laughs> but without a guitar around my neck, it was just a terrifying experience. Well, Doctor, <laughs> uh, congratulations Thank to you, you for that. Yes, and absolutely. For an, an amazing career, and may it continue well, for many, many years to, to come. If this is another uh, great honor. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Sandy. Cheers, Bob. Uh, coming up next, we have uh, Chef Bob Arneal with us, and he's going to make an amazing seafood appetizer. For over a decade now, Chef To Go in St. John's has been the go-to place for folks wanting to learn how to cook at home and for home chefs to, with some skill, to kind of up their game. The chef proprietor, teacher, chef, sometimes <laughs> caterer <laughs> at Chef To Go is Bob Arneal and we're delighted to welcome him to the program today. Hi Bob. Hello Carl, thank you very much for having me. Steve? Well it's great to have you Bob, that's for sure. And what are we going to be making today? I see some, there's some seafood, maybe some chowder, I don't know, beet chips, what have we got? Chowder indeed, yeah, we have going to do a fish and seafood chowder, always really popular in, mm -hmm. uh, in Newfoundland. So. Um, 
We have the fish here, and this is salmon, cod, and some cold water shrimp, our, our local shrimp. And has this been cooked at all? And this has just been barely poached. So oh, the, the, okay. uh, the fish stock that we use for the chowder is just poured over the fish. Mm -hmm. It's left for about a minute, and mm -hmm. you can see it's just a little bit translucent. Oh, very much so. So now we're just going to uh, pour the fish into our chowder. Try not to splash it all over your Oh, that's nice okay. Uh, I'm used to that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take that from you. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Fish poached in water, or it was fish stock. So that's where the uh, that's where the deep flavor will come from. Is mm -hmm. the uh, is the stock. So the fish bones from the salmon uh, are cooked for about an hour and a half uh, in aromatics and vegetables, and uh, uh, and that's where we get the broth. So the flavor is already built up, and nice. now we yeah, intensify the, the flavor from putting it on the fish. So uh, we'll just let that heat up a little bit in there, mm -hmm. and then how we're going to plate it. What we do um, when we're doing it for the cooking classes is we'll um, then take the fish out of the, the chowder and put it into the bowls. Mm -hmm. And that way you know everybody has uh, and it's some fish in, it, yeah. in in their bowl. So I'll just uh, take this out. Bob, is there any seafood that you would not put in a chowder? Oh boy, that's an interesting question. Um, trying to think now. I've always wondered about salmon myself, but I notice you're, <laughs> yeah. you're using it here, so. Yeah, it's, uh, salmon I find it, it has, um, a, you know, it certainly has a strong flavor, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice, uh, rich flavor. Probably uh, anything oilier than salmon, like maybe mackerel. You, you right, know, yeah, yeah, yeah stay away from it. And also any, anything, you know, like tuna or anything really expensive, you would use for something else. So uh, a lot of times with the chowder, you'll use up the, uh, the bits and pieces of fish trim that you have, uh, that you have left around. So. What about, uh, you know, this is a, obviously a dairy chowder. It is, yeah. Um, what about, you know, something like, um, I don't know, a cioppino, uh, an Italian type chowder, Mediterranean type chowder, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which uses tomato. Right. Yep. Would, the, would you use the same, utilize the same kind of seafood? A lot of times they'll, they'll use um, more uh, Mediterranean style fish for that. So um, a lot of times more flavorful, uh, mm -hmm. more flavorful, okay. kind of richer, richer fish. Because of the shellfish uh, in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So now, um, how we, the chowder itself I have in, in our little jug here, so we can just pour that into the bowl over our fish. I like the idea of that having the, the, the seafood in there because everybody's going to get some seafood now, aren't everybody's they? Everybody's going to get it. Hasn't up at all. It's a bit of seafood. Nice seafood. Um, and this, uh, there is a, uh, some potatoes in the chowder as well, um, but we're also going to garnish it with some uh, whipped potatoes. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's, okay. Uh, that's in our piping bag. So we're just going to pipe that into a nice little this this is a heavy appetizer in the, uh, in the, in the middle. <laughs> this is a meal. This, this, <laughs> this could be uh, this could be yes. This could be a, a lunch. Uh, okay, yeah, a lunch sure. Lunch yeah. Dish. yeah, yeah. Uh, we also have some uh, dehydrated beet chips. Now, how did you and, do those? Uh, uh, these are uh, sliced really thinly. Um, and then dehydrated in um, in a food dehydrator. You could also use a, a, a low oven um, until they get really crisp. And it takes. And a food dehydrator takes uh, up to eight hours oh, yeah, because okay. there's a lot of yeah, moisture yeah. in the uh, in the beets, mm -hmm. um, and then they get nice and crispy and and uh, take on a um, a real deep flavor. And of course, you get that crispness which everybody mm -hmm. everybody likes. We also have some some mussels. And you put sea salt on there as well. And, and there's the exactly there's some fleur de sel on, yeah. uh, on the on the um, the beets. It's actually um, um, the the local uh, uh, sea salt. Salt. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Mussels around the uh, the outside of our dish. We have some chives here as well. Fresh from your garden, no doubt. Uh, yes, I grow them outside and in. So, okay. Yeah. So and you chives have around there. Something interesting yeah, and here. And we also have some of the dehydrated beets I've ground in a spice grinder. So I'm oh, very carefully. Good. Now that that's great. This is all about presentation. Right yeah. around the rim there, carefully to give us some nice color on the rim. Nice. Is that beautiful? Absolutely. We also have uh, oils. Just to finish everything off, this is uh, a little bit of chili oil. This will just give it a little kick. Kick, yeah. A little bit of yeah. bite. Speaking of kick, would you ever put booze in uh, a chowder? Uh, yes, indeed. There is, a, in fact, a booze in, in this one, and it's on, oh. on the recipe. There's uh, <laughs> you know, a little bit of white wine. White, white wine to steam the mussels in, and, yeah. uh, and the, the chowder is finished with a little bit of sherry. Mm. Great. Okay. Well, let's have a little uh, quick taste. Taste? Absolutely. Um, Oh my goodness. Mm. You that taste is the chili oil going through mm. there, gives it a little bit of bite. Oh my goodness. A masterpiece. Mm. Absolutely. Thank Once again, thank you very much, <laughs> my Bob. My Bob pleasure. O'Neill of Chef to Go. Thank you. And folks, that's it for this edition of One Chef, One Critic.